Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick and with me as always is the resident DuckTales fan, Mackenzie. How are you? I'm good. I brought back the joke intros. How do you feel about that? You do what you want, man. <laughs> Intro, however, makes you happy. That's that's the Christmas spirit for you. <laughs> so we're recording our last episode before we will take a break for the rest of the year, and we'll see you all in the new year. But you know, it's kind of cool that we're ending with what it will be our fiftieth official episode of the show. So woo, we Wait, made it actually? to a milestone. Yeah, yeah, huh, cool. So yeah, Red River job, Part everyone. Two. Yeah. It's kind of fun. To all our listeners in the far reaches of the world, yes, we know you're there, Thailand people. We <laughs> thank you for your patronage, and we thank you. We hope you will continue to support and listen to Historia Canadiana. Absolutely. And like, yeah, definitely. I'm hoping that the show will keep growing in the new year and all that. I let's let's set a goal for like 10 patrons for the new year. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, how many do we have like right now? Three? Three. Yeah. Okay. That's something. By we the just way, have to thank- triple it, people. Yeah. Plus one. Plus one. <laughs> Obviously, as always, if you do want to support the show, you can check out our Patreon where we get extra episodes every month and you get early access to our feed, right? And often they are unedited shows. So consider subscribing. It's a great Christmas gift for that Canadian history lover in your life. I know I would like to get a Patreon subscription to something. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so today, as we were saying, we're going to continue the second part and finalize what we had started last episode, two weeks ago, the Red River Resistance, right? So, Mac, do you mind recapping us a bit as to what we talked about in the previous episode? Like, what, who the main players were, what this resistance was all about, or what you remember from it, basically? Um, there's the Métis, the French and the English. Yep. And then there's the Hudson's Bay Company, and then there's the government of Canada that is mostly newly formed. Yes. And government of Canada is trying to come and be like, you're our subjects now. Yes, and because they like, bought Rupert's land. Yeah, they bought some arbitrary piece of land that the Hudson Bay Company owns. Like, yeah, you bought the Hudson's Bay Company. You can't buy me, bitch. <laughs> Slavery is and officially illegal. You can't buy me. <laughs> you can't buy me. <laughs> you, you bought the land from the Hudson's Bay Company, but now you have to buy the land from me. Buy it twice. Watch me not care. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's what the Canadian government said. Watch me not care. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. And, and then so they then tried, happened? and then they, they took that mentality and they tried some dumb little shenanigans to try and like mess with the Metis people. Mm-hmm. And the Metis people clapped back and they said, We ain't going to fall for your bullshit. Mm-hmm. And then the Metis English and the Metis French are sort of working together, or at least they're not working against each other. Right. Exactly. All right. And where did we, do you remember where we left off in the last uh, episode? Um, Canada has to send people to negotiate, I believe. Right. So where we had left off last episode. And there's episode, a guy named uh, Louis Riel out there somewhere. Yeah, just like a minor character. In... He's not important. Don't worry about it, man. Yeah. So last episode, we kind of focused on the rise of like Métis antagonism in the face of encroaching the encroaching Canadian government. Um, and we mostly focused on two characters, Charles Mayer, who was a member, kind of like a representative of the Canadian party, and Louis Riel, who's obviously uh, the leader, or at least the de facto leader of the Métis rebellion. There's, he's never like, he, he will be eventually considered the president of the provisional government, which we're going to be talking about today, but he, he's always kind of considered a de facto leader in a sense because he's so charismatic and he just has like, people seem to naturally coalesce towards his ideas, which is kind of interesting. I think that there was never, or for the longest time, there was never like a truly elected leader of the Métis, right? Yeah, where we last left off was basically the Métis had captured a party of Canadian militiamen. I don't think, they, they weren't officially soldiers. They were literally citizens who decided to take up arms against uh, the Métis, right, who had set up camp at Fort Garry right, in 1870, in 1860, 1970. And something that I wanted to mention last episode but forgot that would be kind of interesting is that there's something that was a bit off with the Canadian party, aside from the fact that they were just a bunch of people taking up arms against indigenous populations. And 
that I think that can kind of set us up for this episode. So I'm going to be pulling from Jean Thea's book, The Northwest is Our Mother, which I pulled from a lot of our last episode, and I think can kind of set us up. So this is just before the, uh, the capture of Schultz's men. So Schultz tried to keep 60 armed men in his compound, but 300 Métis led by Riel forced them to surrender. Right? So that was what we were dealing with before. And basically what Thea goes on to say is, the Canadian party was seemed like obs to, to, to be observing something, right? Hoping kind of that it seems the Métis would light a fire perhaps, but it never came, right? And they keep trying to look and ask like, oh, you know, it's cold. Why don't you set, uh, why don't you light a fire, warm us up and all that. And it made Riel and one of his companions suspicious. And they actually carefully inspected the compound and found that gunpowder had been stashed everywhere, right? It had been stashed underneath the beds, it wrapped in blankets, underneath the furniture, in the basement, like everywhere, Schultz's men had kind of placed gunpowder caches throughout the fort, right? And they were hoping that if the Métis had lit a fire, they would basically blow themselves up, right? Of course they did. And so basically, as Teye says, Schultz and his men had just made a credible effort to kill 300 Métis. It never happened. Like, they never lit a fire or late. They did after the gunpowder would have um, been cleared. But it kind of sets the stage of, like, what we're dealing with here, right? And That's it, I, so fucking... Jesus Christ, people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you have to say about that? Like, is... is to me, I kind of expected it. Like, I... I kind of expected something that sneaky to happen. I guess. I just, I guess just not on that level. I don't know. It seems kind of really extreme, especially considering like we were saying last episode that there wasn't a lot of straight up violence between the two. It was mostly standoffish and one negotiating with the other in a really tense way. And to suddenly like credibly try to kill 300 people by blowing mm -hmm. them up just seems like a rapid escalation. I don't know. It's, it's fascinating to me that this is what people, like, they thought this would work. Mm -hmm. They thought this was a legitimate plan that the Métis people wouldn't notice it, you know? Yeah. And it's like, how stupid do you think these people are? <laughs> As a genuine question, like, how <laughs> dumb do you think these people are? Well, apparently quite, because as we saw with, like, Re Mayor's writing last week and all that, there's still this perception of them of indigenous populations in general and Métis as well is like, yeah, exactly. They are not on the level of Europeans and all it needs is a single spark at that point, right? It's like, even if they took the chance, even if they did think they were smart for, for whatever reason, right? You take a chance that perhaps they don't take the time to look at, uh, in their beds and stuff like that and just light a fire as they would most nights to keep warm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, regardless of the motivation behind it, it is insane. And I wanted to start with this just because as we're going to be getting into the episode, I think it's kind of important to keep in mind the reaction that certain Canadian officials and Canadian people would have to Métis antagonism, which comparatively I feel would be much less grave than perhaps killing 300 people in an explosion. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, like just kind of a bit of a foreshadowing here as to what's going to happen. Let, let's, let's take that four, let's stick it deep in the shadows. <laughs> So it's around this time, right, once the, once the Schultz party of 45 men is, um, is captured, that Louis Riel would propose a provisional government, right, on December Woo! 8th. Provisional uh, government! Absolutely. And we, we kind of left the episode off at that moment last time, um, where basically the provisional government was intended to replace the Council of Assiniboia, right, which was kind of the, the, the government of Red River. Okay. Um, and... What, I'm, what we'll be referring to here in terms of the literature is the Declaration of the People of Rupert's Land and the Northwest, which is written and declared, basically it's the proclamation of the provisional government, right, on December 8th, 1869, right? And I think it's a really interesting document in and of itself, right? We were talking a little bit about it before uh, recording. There's a lot to unpack here. It's not a very long document. It's what, six paragraphs six paragraphs but some say some of them are so short they could be like combined yeah absolutely and yeah we can go through a bit of it just to kind of set the scene as to what the intent of this provisional government is and what um 
yeah, what they're expecting, I guess, or what we can gather from Louis Riel and the Métis plans here in instoring a Hudson, uh, a provisional government. It is, it's kind of wacky. Okay. I'm not going to lie. Okay. As I say about most government documents that we read on the show, they're all a <laughs> wacky. Okay, what makes this one particularly wacky? Let me read the first sentence. Whereas it is admitted by all men as a fundamental principle that the public authority commands the obedience to respect, respect of its subjects. I guess that's a fundamental principle that we have to be governed now. Okay, good to know. It is also admitted that a people, when it has no government, is free to adopt one form of government in preference to another to give or to refuse allegiance to that which is proposed. Mm -hmm. So you, have, you, st you still have to adopt government, though. Yeah. You still have to accept government or else. In accordance with the above first principle, the people of this country had obeyed and respected the authority towards the circumstances which are in its infancy compelled it to be su the subject. Only obeyed and respected the authority because you slaughtered most of the people who were living here. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about that. <laughs> but it's, it is kind of interesting, right? So to me, when I read this, it kind of comes back to the mixed heritage element of the Métis population, right? Mm -hmm. So, and as we mentioned last time, it's not like Riel and the Métis were opposed to the to entering the idea of confederation. They just wanted no. to do it on their own terms. Yeah, right? they just and, wanted equality when they did it. And this is sort of this weird first sentence to me is almost like, we were talking about it before, but it's mm -hmm. a perfect example of the illusion of the state or whatever, you know? Like, yeah. everybody just sort of accepts that this is the way they have to do it. You know, like, we know that you know that we know that we all have to play this little game right now to make sure we don't all go to hell in a handbasket. Literally, so that we don't blow ourselves up. In yeah. This case. So we all have to play nice right now, and we all <laughs> have to keep up with what we have to do to keep up appearance, you know? Yeah. But it is interesting that, at least in the first sentence, the declaration uses the term public authority, yeah. right? So that can be construed in a variety of ways, obviously. He didn't, they didn't go on to say, to use the term government specifically, because I think they want to actually, uh, they want to actually be on par with the Canadian people and use language that they, that, that they understand, right? But it is an interesting use of the term. It, to me, it allows to imagine that greater flexibility that indigenous populations would have had with government mm -hmm. institutions or public bodies, right? Which they did have and still do, obviously, but it wasn't as rigid, say, as the European style governments, right? So that's why I was saying there is that kind of tug and pull with the Métis here in this case of European and indigenous kind of merging into one another. And again, like I do... Because it was a weird situation for everybody to be in because... Mm -hmm. It was Rupert's land before. Yes. So, and before that, it wasn't owned by anybody. Like, the land was the land. That's the First Nations relationship. But then, so they acknowledge that. The company of adventures known as the Hudson Bay Company and invests with certain powers granted by His Majesty Charles II established itself in Rupert's land in the Northwest Territory for trading purposes only. Yeah. This company, consisting of many persons, required a certain constitution. But as there's a question of, com of com commerce only, their constitution was framed in reference there too. Yet, since there was at the time no government to see to the interests of the people already existing in the country, it became necessary for judic judicial affairs to have recourse to the officers of the Hudson Bay Company. This inaugurated that species of government, which, slightly modified by subsequent circumstances, ruled this country up to recent date. Right. Which makes sense. Like, the Métis people are not the Hudson Bay Company. They right. aren't run by a company or corporation. They have to have a system of laws that reflects that. Yes. But it's also kind of interesting. It, it, it comes back to your idea of the illusion of it all, right? This is one of the things I wrote down in, in my notes when, when I was reading through this is like, it shows kind of a really great awareness of the history of the Hudson's Bay Company in that it acted like a government, but on paper, it was never intended as such, or at least it was intended as such, but it was never like specifically it's stated that this is what it was, right? Like it was a private entity that ran a corporation. It was not a government. And so you have to deal with it in that respect, right? which is not that, something folks, that, th that a corporation is not a government. <laughs> Can we, can we keep that in our back pockets? Like, not, not for this episode, just in life in general. I mean, for can this we... episode as well, because the Canadian... I think it's also a bit more important just in general. Oh, yeah. Like, of we, course, we, of we recognize and remember companies, corporations are not reasonable forms of government. <laughs> Please. Right. But like, Please, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> um, but it's, it's kind of interesting that at least there's this awareness of it. 
Um, and I, to me, there's almost a bit of a slap in the face when they put Hudson's Bay Company in air quotes or in like quotation marks known as the quote unquote Hudson's Bay Company as if it like adds a term of officiality to it. Mm. To me, it's almost ironic, but I, I, I don't know about that. I, maybe it's a transcription thing and it's supposed to be in italics regardless. I, I think it was kind of, it's kind of funny to think about it. I was like, the Hudson's Bay Company is not that special, guys. It was a fur trading business. They made hats. And yeah, they... that was all it was. It wasn't like they own most of the land of Canada or North America. Yeah, but it's like they owned it on paper, but in reality, like a lot of people were still able to do what they wanted, right? Especially mm -hmm. after 1849 when, the, when its monopoly was increasingly uh, chipped away at. Right? I don't know. Like... I think this is a really um, interesting like way to open it up. So like, yes, there is a need for a government in a sense, or at least a public authority, but it shouldn't be the Hudson's Bay Company style. No. Right? Because they weren't actually, they weren't, it wasn't a safe situation where everybody was trying to make a life, live with families and all that sort of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was, they were just people at work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They were, and that's kind of where a lot of the of the Métis originally came from in in and of themselves, right? A lot of these workers, once their contracts were up, they just stayed in the area, so they became settlers. But again, they became free, uh, what they called des gens libres, right? Free men. So they were kind of the the Hudson's Bay Company had no control over them once they actually got out of their contract with them. So again, it removes that element of public authority wherein you only have authority over certain people within certain constraints. But yeah. Did you read the rest of the, uh, of the declaration? I skinned it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, yeah, in essence, it's... Go ahead. It was almost like they're saying, you know, oh, you guys, it's almost a recognition. No, you're not a corporation. You're people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Seems to be the very recurring theme to me. Yeah. It's... The, the first, uh, what is it, the fourth paragraph starts, it is also generally admitted that a people is at liberty to establish any form of government it may consider suited to its wants. Mm -hmm. As soon as the power to which it was subject abandons it or attempts to subjugate it without its consent to a foreign power and maintain that no right can be transferred with, to such foreign power. Now, therefore, first, we, the representatives of the people, uh, on well, they wrote this on the day of twenty fourth, on November twenty fourth, but it was published in December. Uh, after having invoked the God of Nations, relying on these fundamental moral principles, declare that the government we had always respected abandoned us by transferring to a strange power the sacred authority confided to it. Right, and that second, we refuse the authority of Canada, which pretends to have right to coerce us. I think this is kind of interesting. Um, so I skipped over certain parts just to, for the sake of brevity, because they use a lot of description in this that's perhaps unnecessary. But um, to me, it's kind of interesting that they do make that link between the Hudson's Bay Company and Canada, right? It kind of seamlessly merges one into the other. Uh, which from a literary perspective, I think is very interesting, but just also from a historical perspective, which again, on paper, it's two different, uh, different entities, but in practice, they kind of had the same goals of settlement and uh, how could I say this and gain, right? In terms of the fur trade and so on and so forth and land. So, Get those gains. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. And I do, I do really enjoy the, the, that first sentence of like, a government is only as strong as it allows a certain level of freedom, right? And at least the Hudson's Bay Company allowed for that. So far, the Canada, uh, the Canadians have not really demonstrated that <laughs> this is what they want. Right? <laughs> so what are you going to do about it? Well, in this case, set up our own government until, until you prove us otherwise. Well, yeah, it's, it's almost kind of crazy how Canada is trying to take a look at how they want to form their government because this is again just post confederation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so if there's only four provinces, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, soon to be five. Yeah, how does Canada deal with that? You know, how does Canada decide who goes where, who does what, and how are people become part of their country? Yes, because there's a lot of questions around that. There's a lot of questions, so why? Why should they take a look at Manitoba? Why should they give it all the equal rights and freedoms that the, they just had to fight mm -hmm. to get all these other provinces, you know, to join? Yep. And I can see the mind, I can see the logic of we don't want to upset them by just letting anybody have whatever they want. Yes. But they still go about it in a really stupid way. But like, let's just hope they blow themselves up. 
Mm-hmm. Like, that's the dumbest logic. Again, like... It's, it's like it's, you it's, said in the notes. The Ottawa sent a team of representatives with instructions only to reassure the local populace of Canada's good intentions. They weren't but, trying to actually do anything. They were just trying to keep everybody happy. And trying to keep every ha- everybody happy is a very quick way to make everybody not happy. Right. And there's a really, I, I didn't quote it down, uh, write it down here where exactly, but there's a moment in Taya's book where she brings up the fact that McDonald, when he found out about what was going on in Red River, right, obviously outside of just the general racist comments that he would make and everyone else made about the Métis, but there's a very interesting point where he says, I would never, basically the Canadian government would have never agreed to buying Rupert's Land if they knew that it would be such trouble mm-hmm. from the get-go. Right, because I think it brings back to what you were saying. There was already such a difficulty with getting the four initial provinces on board that suddenly, like literally two years after, you're already facing what is tantamount to uh, a war or close to a war. War, right? Um, <gasps> and <laughs> yeah, yo, what is it good for? Absolutely not. Yeah, yo. sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. But what is it good for? You tell me. Apparently, creating a province. But it, 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 it is. But it wasn't. No, exactly. But it is kind of interesting that that mindset definitely permeates of like, we, the first time we, we made Confederation or like the first provinces we entered in, at least we were able to do it through negotiation and all that. But as soon as someone goes against the idea of Confederation, then that's where it's like, it kind of already comes apart at the seams of saying like, oh, well, maybe we send in the army. Maybe we go to war. Like just because you're not operating on the same level of, uh, on the same mindset that we are. And it's very, it's very interesting to me to think about that. I don't have an answer as to, well, obviously it's like imperialism and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. um, it, it is very interesting that that's not a moment that we hear a lot about in Canadian history of this idea of either you negotiate the British way or you die <laughs> or you get moved. You either play ball our way or we're going to murder you. Right. But obviously our way we're, or death. Obviously, we're oversimplifying it for the sake of a bit of a joke here, but like that's kind of what you're not really. Not exactly. That's like that's a bit what we're dealing with here. Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up about the declaration? I just love how they keep like it's a very the use of the word government. That mm-hmm. government, which is this government, but not the government which you want for your government. <laughs> Without, yeah. I love how they actual they also named the Hudson's Bay Company, His Majesty Rupert. Like they named all the different players except the Métis people. Yeah, kind of like the Bill of Rights that we had read last time, eh? where it's not a question of race or culture necessarily. In this case, in this case, it's a question of being properly represented. Yeah, they don't. Even, I, I'm trying. They've they in interest of the British subjects. We were seeing these films. After having invoked the God of Nations. Yep. There's, uh, no, they don't even say, they don't call them Indians. They don't call them indigenous. They don't like. Nothing of that. They don't talk about them. But I don't think it, it matters it, I, in I, this case. The usual, I can get over it, whatever. But the Métis are a bit of both, aren't they? Mm-hmm. That's the background of the Métis. But no, let's not mention them at all, even though they're the people that are living there. Let's mention everybody else except the people who are most affected by this declaration. Right. How do you think that would affect the, the way like, that people received this? Because like, the way I read it, when the, what you bring up is like, it's more of an attack on the failures of those other people. Right? It's less about what we can do, but how you failed at what you could have done. Right? But I don't know. Did you have anything else that, like, how that would have... Einstein is twenty twenty, but how do you like? How could you not expect them to still be pissy after this? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. my main question. Like, how can you? You don't call them by their name. You don't actually seem to take care about who, what they are as a people. Any respect for them? You're just doing this to keep them happy. Like, what did you think was going to happen, folks? Yeah. If somebody did that to you, what would you like? Did would you be happy with that? Right. You weren't. You made a whole country about it. You had a whole confederation project. <laughs> like right. they have literally seen this happen before in Quebec mm-hmm. when the French Canadians were told no you don't exist what did they do they got very angry they yep. did not think the same thing was going to happen here absolutely but it's it's also interesting like that right like you're saying the Métis on their end also are kind of not necessarily but are depersonalizing a lot of the people from the government they're kind of all lumping them in together under this similar mentality of saying this is what Canada as a whole represents 
right? So there is a bit of that element of dehumanization that goes on as well. In this case, I kind of agree with it that that's even when you're either liberal or conservative at this time, that kind of what, what that's kind of what, what Canada represented. But the, the, you still get that kind of back and forth. And from a rhetorical perspective, it makes a whole lot of sense because you don't want to write like an interminable text that explains like who specifically is at fault, although they do mention William McDougall specifically here. Um, but it is very effective, I think, in a way of saying like Canada as an idea is the problem here, right? As it's been operating. Yeah, as it's been operating up to this point. Yeah. There's some things we need to fix, but nobody wants to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So again, this provisional, the, this declaration, right, it didn't officially set up the provisional government in a sense. Uh, it was mostly a proposal that would be renegotiated by the French and English Métis over the next few weeks. But by and large, a lot of historians see as like, pretty much this is a moment when the Métis kind of start really taking control over the area, right? So as you were mentioning, Canada sent in some, uh, some emissaries, mostly to kind of assuage the population, which by and large remained skeptical uh, of their ability to actually do anything effectively. Um, and there were two specific meetings with a Canadian emissary named Donald Smith, who we will focus on um, a bit more here, because they're mostly the major turning points, I would say. So had you ever heard of Donald Smith, by the way? Um... I don't remember. No. He's, he's probably one of those figures that you've seen and know if you, uh, and you would know, but you probably don't recognize the name. I Have don't. you ever seen the, the picture of the last spike being driven into the railroad with the old man with a sledgehammer? Possibly. Okay. That old man is Donald Smith. Uh -huh. Okay. So Donald Smith was one of the, was a kind of multi- capacity person within the Canadian uh, government and sphere. He was one of the main investors in the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh -huh. And honestly, what I think is some of the most delicious historical poetry of this moment, where a, not only a Canadian emissary for the, an emissary for the Canadian government, but kind of like this driving force behind the railroad would come to negotiate very distinctly with these people who did not necessarily want the railroad to pass through their land or any kind of road to pass through their land, as we addressed last time. Mm -hmm. So to me, it is very funny that he was the person to, to kind of deal with the Métis or at least talk to them very directly, right? Just a bit of historical poetry, like I was saying here, which I find kind of nice. I don't know if it was intended or not, but probably not. So... Donald Smith would actually come into Red River disguised as a Hudson's Bay Company trader. Um, and he basically started off by talking with everyone except the Métis. Of course. <laughs> because of course you would. If you're sent to negotiate with the Métis, why would you talk to them? That's absurd. Right? <laughs> and he would basically try to start a divide and conquer strategy. Right, kind of turning the people of Red River against the Métis. He actually tried to bribe some of the Métis people who were close to Louis Riel uh, before he actually met with the Métis. Mm -hmm. um, and on January 19th and 20th of 1870, so three weeks after the, uh, almost a month and a half, sorry, after the provisional government is declared, Donald Smith would actually attend a convention uh, with the Métis, right? Basically, he arrived with a bunch of declarations from uh, the Canadian government saying that we want peace and that uh, the Queen herself, Queen Victoria at that time, um, is hoping that we can resolve this in a relatively good manner without too much blood loss or anything like that. Kind of disappointing in the end. Okay, so that's kind of what's kind of funny and why people remember this moment is that as Smith arrived, he kind of revealed himself as not being an HBC trader, but as a Canadian emissary and ordered everyone to drop their weapons and to submit to the Canadian government, <laughs> right? That was like his initial <laughs> goal. And because of the Métis that he had bribed and given money to, he was hoping that they would help him in this. But what backfired is that the Métis were like, yeah, no, your money didn't do anything. <laughs> like the Métis he bribed just stared at him as he was just alone in front of a crowd of angry. <laughs> 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 Which again, mwah, absolutely phenomenal stuff. Perfect. <laughs> so nevertheless. We don't care about money, my dude. 
That's I, not the issue. I forget how much the actual amount was, but it, it really wasn't, right? Like, that's exactly, it's like, you, you really don't get what we're dealing with here if you're just trying to bribe one of us or two of us here. Like, that's not what the issue is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's at that moment, like, you would read statements from the queen, nothing hugely extraordinary. Pretty much what this convinced a lot of people was that the Canadians were operating under bad faith right? Uh, If they have to send in an emissary that's kind of hidden and who assumes that he just bribe his way out of this, it's not really a good sign, right? Mm -hmm. So it's at that moment that the provisional government is formally created. And it's around this time that the English Métis would now fully um, join in with the French Métis, right? And they would pretty much act as one from this moment on, right? There would be obviously some debate, internal debates within how to operate going forward, but it wasn't as clear of a divide as it had been until then. Okay. Um, the provisional government, by the way, would also stoke certain fears in the Canadians because there were some minor rumors that the Americans would get involved into all of this. And if there's one thing that scares any kind of Canadian government, it's Americans. And so obviously this whole thing, this whole discussion of uh, resistance to to the Canadian government and creating their own independent nation has a lot of rumblings of like American independence style and republicanism. Mm -hmm. Um, From what I've read, most of this was rumors. I don't think Louis Riel ever formally considered like joining up with the Americans, but I do think it is kind of a nice... uh, Shows just how much they were afraid of America. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Americans! Yes, and it the also boogeyman, kind of, the boogeyman of Canada, <laughs> the boogeyman of Canada, Americans and indigenous people. <laughs> Ooh, these scary Americans are gonna come and steal our your maple syrup. But not just that, indigenous people that side with Americans. Now that's yes. just like a top tier level of horror, right? There. That's the sixth level of hell. <laughs> sixth circle. It, it's the same thing. It, it's a circle, but whatever. So. All of this debacle basically resulted in Smith's agreement to take back to Canada a statement of what Red River regarded as essential to its acceptance of Canadian rule, right? And this is where um, the list of rights comes in. So there's a second list of rights that is formally written by the provisional government. Um, And yeah, so they wanted a convention of 40 delegates uh, that was equally divided between the two language groups, French and English. Um, and they basically, uh, they basically wrote this list of rights to take to Canada. Did you actually look at those lists? At that list? That second list one? of rights? Yeah. Uh, a little bit. Mm-hmm. Anything that strikes out to you or is it pretty much like the conventional stuff you'd expect? Yeah, it's more of that, you know? Mm-hmm. It's almost, it's, I don't know. I didn't, I don't think they were asking for anything crazy. No. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty much an elaboration on what we had seen last week with the original Bill of Rights, right? Um, they're basically Were the Métis asking, looking to have control over the Northwest Territory? Or did the, the Métis live in the Northwest Territory? Yes. Officially, okay. it is still considered... Like, Northwest Territory... So this is us moving away from Manitoba. This is more specifically for the Northwest Territory. But that's the thing. Manitoba was part of the Northwest Territory at the time. Basically, oh, everything... Oh, so we haven't had that split yet. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, okay. So when they refer to Northwest Territory and Rupert's Line, it's pretty much the same thing. It's two different names for the same area, more or less. Um, so everything west of Ontario was the Northwest Territories up until British Columbia. Um, so it's basically a lot of elaboration on what we had seen originally, um, but with a bigger emphasis on property, I guess, and the actual rights of the Métis population. Um, so you'll have things like, I think like the number 20 was really cool, actually. So the Northwest Territory shall never be held liable for any portion of the 3,000 pounds paid to the Hudson's Bay Company for any portion of the public debt of Canada as it yeah. stands at the time of our entering into confederation, if. So it's all, again, it kind of shows the multifaceted element of the Métis thought here of like... Well, it's, it's, I like that though. I like mm-hmm. that lot because why should they pay for the debt that they weren't a part of? Yeah. But also, none, they're none firmly of this is their problem and their fault. No, but also they're firmly aware of the way that Canada has tended to operate in the past of like, well, if you want to be a part of this, you have to kind of play ball. And that includes taxes and being able to pay back certain damages, no matter how broadly construed those damages can be, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you'll definitely 
have that. Right. No, it all seems like it, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fine. I like it. There's a very layered approach here, you know, of what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish to make sure that they guaranteed their certain rights and freedom. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, again, you can kind of see some, some like they're, they're kind of operating with a lot of good faith here as to the fact that, yeah, the Canadian government will respect some of these. Cause look at number 15, it's like they mentioned treaties. So the treaties to be concluded between the Dominion and several Indian tribes of this country as soon as possible. So they kind of aware that this is how it's going to be, but they're hoping that because of their place now as, um, as having most of the people of Red River on their side as being relatively well armed, that at least this time it'll be different, right? Mm -hmm. That the treaties will not just be a way of erasing indigenous populations, but that it will be what they actually promised originally, which is perhaps a bit naive, but still an interesting inclusion i find really kind of interesting for example that the military force required in this country be composed of natives of the country during four years withdrawn after a vote of 16 days to 16 yays to 23 days okay yeah i like that i well i don't like it but i find it's interesting because you're almost you don't want it to be a british military mm -hmm. yeah and it has it has certain other implications like immigrants can join the military so on and so forth of course but, it's a different discussion to have, but I almost think it's kind of fascinating that they were very much like, we want people who will be loyal to the country, defending this country and its people mm -hmm. over the empire it just came from. Yes, exactly. It's a series of where do you place your, the, the emphasis of your, uh, of your people, right? Uh, and stuff yeah. like that. But it's also, I, I do uh, enjoy the inclusion in this version of like withdrawn after a vote of 16 days to 23 days. So I don't know why it was withdrawn, like what the motivation was behind it. Perhaps they didn't want to bring up the idea of the military, right? And just kind of open up that whole can of worms of what happens if they actually do need to fight for Canada, yeah. right? Or on behalf of Canada, which is a sticky situation uh, whenever you involve indigenous populations. So I don't know why it was withdrawn specifically, what the motivations were of the Métis, but it is, I do think that's a fascinating inclusion in this version. Anything else? Um, you're wonderful. Thank you. So are you. All right. So moving on, in early February, the Canadian prisoners who had been taken by the Métis uh, in December, those who had not escaped were formally released, right? Yay! And three Métis delegates were appointed to go to Ottawa and negotiate admission of Red River and Manitoba, and what would become Manitoba, into Canada, right? Nice. So, so far, things seem pretty stable, I would say. Like relatively, it's right? they things are progressing nicely because everybody's keeping up with the illusion. Right, exactly. I mean, again, it's kind of like might as well keep up with the illusion if it means that nobody's gonna die, <laughs> like, yeah. which is obviously a whole issue. But yeah, That's but of course, can of worms. wonderful potential negotiations can only last so long because guess who's gonna rear their wonderful head again after this. The Canadian have... Party. Oh, okay. Those... I we are going to say John McDonald's. Oh, my God. I mean, he's always in the background of this, by the way. He'll be more in the background of the further Northwest Rebellion in 1885. But in this one, he's very much in the background being like, we need to get this done. Like, this is, right. the, this is not looking good. A good way to start the country. Exactly. Again, it's kind of funny to remember just how rocky a start Canada had. Like Thomas Darcy McGee assassinated in 1868, the Métis Rebellion, the like all kinds of issues with the French Canadians already rising up and like the rise of French Canadian nationalism. So rise up, <laughs> rise up Canada nationalism. <laughs> Um, so anyway, yeah, it's at this moment that the Canadian party would decide to pop up again and they would recreate another force of people, right? Um, which had the intention of freeing those prisoners that had just been freed by the Métis because news travels very slowly in 1870. Um, so... They didn't know that the Métis had released the prisoners, and so they gathered up a bunch of people, a couple hundred actually by some accounts. Uh, I'd have to look in the book that I have uh, just to make sure. 
Yeah, so Schultz's group numbered about 160 men from English parishes. They had a party of 80 men, and they even got managed to get some Ojibwe on their side. Um, so they had quite a few okay. people. Um, and a force of Canadian-born settlers who were led by a major Bolton, who was one of the surveyors who had originally made uh, the survey for the road that got this whole thing started in the first place. And it also included Thomas Scott, who we mentioned last time, um, as being one of the workers on the road who not only fought for better rights for the workers and better pay, um, but as we will see, will become kind of a major player here. So they would leave Portage La Prairie to join up with Schultz in Kildonan, and they would actually, yeah, they would, they would basically make their way up until up to Fort Gary to try to free these people. And in the process, the first casualty of the Red River resistance would happen. Right. So this is a chapter of Teya's book called Fateful Decisions, and it's not just on the Métis part, but on the Canadian part as well. Right. So. We see here, uh, she, she starts the chapter by saying the Red River resistance lasted for 416 days, so a little over a year. During that time, three people died, including John Hugh Sutherland and Norbert Parisien. Scott, Thomas Scott, who I just mentioned, was tied to two of these deaths, right? Um, Scott was in the Portage party when they captured Parisien on February 15th, 1870. Parisien escaped and in the process stole a gun. He was hiding in the bushes when Sutherland galloped by. Parisien, fearing recapture, shot him twice. Sutherland, Ooh, yeah, Sutherland knew it had been an accident and on his deathbed he pleaded for mercy for Parisien. But his magnanimous gesture came too late. Thomas Scott had already beaten Parisien with a club. Using Parisien's sash, oh Scott God. galloped his horse back and forth over the ice, simultaneously dragging and strangling the, strangling the barely conscious man. Cooler heads prevented Scott from lynching Parisien, but it was hardly a merciful intervention. It condemned Parisien to die slowly from Scott's strangling and vicious beating. So this is where we're at, basically. So the Canadian party comes in mm -hmm. thinking they're going to be doing good, and, they, and two people end up dead in the process. Right. So once they actually found out by arriving at Fort Gary that the prisoners had been liberated, most of the armed party would actually disband. But because of the actions of Scott and just the general desire to invade, Thanks, Scott. Had, yeah. So on February 17th, a group of these men who were on their way back to Portage, right, were arrested and imprisoned by Hiel's men, right, who were mostly going about surveying the area, making sure that there were no invasions or anything like that. And basically, up until then, Louis Hiel had managed to keep the French and Métis, uh, French and English Métis together under the kind of aegis of the provisional government. And the terms to the entrance of Red River to the Canadian Union had been generated. But in the meantime, the Canadian government was kind of preparing an army, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just like one other pawn of like what is slowly devolving. Like where for a brief moment in January 1870, things are like, okay. Not bad. And then as soon as February arrives, it's like Canada tries to invade the Métis capture a Canadian party again. Canada is actually building a legit army. And then just things just slowly escalate once more. And the grand illusion carries on. <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah, basically they, 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 they would start sending troops into, uh, they, they would start to head towards uh, Red River, but they're not going super quickly because things have not completely devolved quite yet. Right. Do you have anything to add before we get into like this really important turning point or is it pretty much what you expected? Yeah, it sounds about right. It's a <laughs> great first test for the new nation of Canada. Yep. Absolutely. Well, that's kind of the thing, right? I wonder how much of this was just like, we can't look weak on an international stage if a bunch of people in a territory can resist us. Mm. Like, I, I, I really don't know. I can only assume that that was part of it, right? Which wouldn't surprise me, but again, it's just like, ugh, whatever. So this is, it's at this moment that we're starting to get into a section of the show where there's a lot of historical debate, right? Not in terms of what happened, but why it happened. So one of the people that, the, that Louis Riesman captured, right, was Thomas Scott. 
right? And it's at this point that a lot of people seem to, whether they agree with it or not, seem to say that Louis Riel made an error in judgment because he allowed Thomas Scott to be tried by a Métis tribunal and, as we'll see the details of, eventually sentenced to death, right? And this is where I'll try to, to jog people's memory as to the fact that you know, the reaction, say, that people had, uh, the will have towards Thomas Scott's death versus how the Métis reacted when Schultz's party tried to kill 300 of them. So just kind of keep that again in the back of your mind as we're going forward. So some people claim that it was, that, that Scott was tried because he was obnoxious and racist, right? Um, according to the New Nation, Mr. Scott was very violent and abusive in his language and actions, annoying and insulting to the guards, and even threatening the president, Louis Riel. He, Scott, vowed openly that if ever he got out, he would shoot the president and further stated that he was the head of the party of Partage people, who, on their way to Kildonan, called at Kutsu's house and searched for the president with the intention of shooting him. Right, so not exactly the best case for Thomas Scott right now of being like, yeah, I want to kill Louis Riel <laughs> very actively. <laughs> Some people also claim that it was strategic. If they let someone like Scott go, not only would he be a risk to the Métis people, but he would you know, be able to go back to Canada and you know, justify a more proper invasion. But ultimately, it's kind of, I don't think it's one of those things that'll ever be properly answered, right? Because we're just kind of dealing with hearsay at this point, right? There are no transcripts of, there are no transcripts of the Métis, like, judgment as far as I know, or at least I could. There's never any transcripts when it comes to Canada, is there? It's all it's just, let's hide I know. everything behind I know. closed doors. I know, it's so wild, but uh, yeah. But what's is something that's interesting with Taya's book, or at least when she talks about the Thomas Scott trial and eventual execution, is that she mentioned specifically that you can't really look at this from a purely British or French legal eye, because that's not how the Métis saw it, right? So they're operating with their own sense of justice, which the, the goal of which is to basically restore harmony in the community rather than right wrongs, as the British or French system is. What she says is, essentially, we can view it as a bit of a mix of French and Métis-style government, insofar as there was a judge, there were people who were present, like a kind of jury, but ultimately the intention behind the trial was different, right, than what European style would have been. Right? Intention behind the trial? <laughs> yeah, like... The first nations people... No, because it's a Métis trial in this case. Yeah, but the, the, okay, let's be real right now. The Canadian government knows they can turn this into a way. Yeah, but I don't know if they know he's on trial yet. Oh, okay, because everything's private. Everything's hidden under closed yeah, doors. Yeah, like they're, they're doing all of this at Fort Garry. There are no Canadians present aside from the prisoners. Yeah, Like they don't necessarily know that this is what's going to be happening. But then they can learn about it later in a bit. It's an unfair trial. He was yeah. not given proper trial. He was not this. He was not blah. He was not tried by a Canadian court. Oh, uh, do you see in the future, Mackenzie? How do you know that this is what's going to happen? You want to, okay, in serious talk, you want to know how we make so many of these calls, me and you, in the multiple right. episodes? Because history repeats itself. Yeah. History is a cycle, folks. I, I disagree a bit. I think people repeat themselves. The actual, because like, I think the idea of history repeating itself kind of ignores the details of history, but. Fine, Pe but look at organizations, government bodies, they all repeat themselves. Right. They live by the sins of their ancestors. Yes. Yeah. And that's like, mm, you take five seconds, folks. Think, take Please. five seconds to, if those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a very important quote from somewhere. By some guy. <laughs> it was, though. It was from Louis Riel. I don't know. <laughs> it was from, from Lord Durham. Right. Yeah. Essentially, Taya says, the trial of Thomas Scott was held before a war council composed of a variety of people. Um, there were both English and French Métis in this trial. It was first said by George Santayana. Cool. I don't know who that is. I'm sure, or maybe I do, and I just don't recognize the name. I really don't know. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. There. So it was then modified by others going forward for, like, say, when uh, Winston Churchill used it. Okay. Right. So base, it's kind of interesting because it's not, again, it's not like death was the only option for Scott here. 
Right. So again, that kind of adds a bit of murkiness as to why they did it, because Taya points out that there's a lot of different ways that Métis people would actually be able to bring about justice. But it's mostly relegated to obviously being able to meet it out by someone who has that same understanding of justice. So she brings up that the Métis had a really interesting system of shaming and banishment, right, that were apparently rather effective within their own communities. Hmm. But you kind of have to think about it of or at least I think of like, would Scott, would that have changed anything for Scott though, who wasn't used to this system and who wasn't raised in a world in which shame would have stopped him from then obviously killing Riel. Well, as he money would have stopped Scott. Bait, shame I, stops I MAT, the money stops the Canadians, but neither side knows that the other won't do anything. Exactly, right? Um, but yeah, ultimately Scott was sentenced to death and on March 4th, um, 1870, he was executed by firing squad. Right. So the Miti trial, according to Deye of Thomas Scott, should not be critiqued as an absence of or inadequate justice. It was not mob rule and it was not primitive, according to Justice! Her. It was duly deliberated with due process, not carried out in the heat of passion, and it was done according to a justice system that had been functioning in the Northwest for half a century. Perhaps they chose the wrong path, considering what would be going forward. But in terms of like knowing what they were doing, there's no doubt about the fact that, yeah, they, 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 they deliberated this for a long time, right? <laughs> so, as you mentioned, Scott's death, once it actually got out to the public, would have enormous re repercussions, especially in Ontario, right? Which basically, as you were saying, had been searching for some excuse to punish Riel and Red River for its refusal to accept, like, Canadian manifest destiny, right? And the death of Thomas Scott was just like, boom, we got it. He was a Protestant. He was white. He was Canadian. What more do you want? He's like us, the Ontarians, or at least like us, the <laughs> Orange Order, which was a dominant force, as we've talked about before in... Um, previous episodes in the irish episode we talked about the orange order which is a dominant orange force uh, of protestant ontario right and basically the orange order along with other ontarians would use this death to stir, stir up anti-metis sentiment in canada so for a long time in i love how that just shows how easy it is to to, to gather anti-first nation sentiment oh i'm surprised that it took so long <laughs> like I'm surprised they actually ah, took it. I'm scared of people who aren't the same as me. Ah! Classic Canada. <laughs> classic, classic, classic Euro Eurocentric countries. I mean, I, I, that's that's a very human thing as well. There's a lot of studies yeah. about it, but yeah. Um, so basically, although nobody in Red River knew that Scott had been a member of the Orange Order, right? They, it, it, I don't know if it would have actually had an impact on their decision because I don't know how aware people in Red River knew of the power of the Orange Order or anything like that. I really don't know. Um, and this is obviously where you get groups like Canada First, which will come back into it and help the Orange Order because they were very close and they would also stir up some sentiments. And basically, it didn't take long before the entire province of Ontario was basically up in arms about the quote-unquote murder of an innocent orangeman for his loyalty to Canada. That's how they spinned it. It was like he was a loyal Canadian. He, he was, was just doing his job, folks. Come yeah. on. And it was like it was framed as cowardly. It was framed as a murder rather than an, a state execution, right? Which, say what you will about executions by the state, it is a different connotation, mm -hmm. right? And while it was written before the murder, this passage from the Niagara Mail in 1870, I think, is rather indicative of what kind of sentiment we're dealing with here. Where it says, let the Dominion government offer three or four hundred acres of land to every Canadian volunteer who will go up next spring to Red River. And enough good fellows will be found to put Riel and his followers under the sod. Oh my God. Yeah, so they're saying, like, basically send in the army and give them land. Which, to me, by the way, is the most, like, indicative of the mentality of Canada, land and military. <laughs> and erasing That's all that matters. People. Yeah, exactly. And like erasing indigenous populations. In this case, like in a single sentence, you got it all. <laughs> Which I don't know how effective that specific piece was, but it's the kind of idea that you're dealing with. <laughs> in the meantime, the Red River delegates arrived in Ottawa, right? With 
this is when large portions of Canada were inflamed and stuff like that. And they arrive in Ottawa and Canada actually refused to officially meet with the delegates or to recognize the provisional government officially because of the huge public outcry that had been formed since uh, in the time that they basically traveled from Red River to Ottawa. It's not to say that they didn't negotiate. They did actually negotiate with the Métis, but they did it in private. Right. Of course they did. Fucking Canada setting itself up to be a fucking shadow state. <laughs> the deep state is Canada. Honestly, and where's the lie? <laughs> no, but from a purely diplomatic standpoint, I kind of understand. Because you're not going to do it publicly and then get lynched, like have your government get destroyed by the people who are actively uh, stirring up. Oh, it's the fact there's no records. I think there is records, but they wouldn't, like at the time, they wouldn't have said it openly. I think that's what I mean by privately is like nobody, people at the, uh, like the general records? public. Is that official? I'm sorry? Do we know that there's records? I, I think there is, but I don't know. I mean, there's a record in so far as the Manitoba Act came out of it. Not the same thing, my man. Exactly. And it's, also, it's also the problem of at the time, they were still sweeping things under the rug. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very indicative of a very larger problem of just trying not to talk about the problem. For sure. Honestly, I don't know what kind of records of those meetings exist. I have, I did not actively look into those just for the sake of time, but I, I, I would it's be... It's not your fault. It's just... No, no, but I, I would actually be curious to know if there are um, records. Yeah. We'll look it up after. I'll put it in the show notes if there's like an addendum that we need to talk about. <laughs> so did you look actually? Um, so that actually kind of segues us nicely. So, so yeah, as we were like saying, those, those kind of negotiations would lead pretty directly to the creation of the Manitoba Act. Saying like, okay, things are devolving. How do we properly bring in Red River so, or Manitoba in general, which was very small at the time, into Canada, right? In a way that pleases both of us, right? And so in 1870, the Manitoba Act would be written, most of which doesn't concern much of us here, but there's a few specific points in the act that directly touch upon how the Métis would be seen or operate going forward. Did you look at them or? The Manitoba Act? Yeah, any of them that you looked at? Well, briefly. Okay. Very briefly. So basically the ones that are important to us here are about numbers 22, points 22 to 30 or something like that, 32. So the, the 22, I think, is really important because that one will come up again in the future because it's legislation touching on schools uh, subject to certain provisions, which basically establishes that any kind of denominational school can exist, right? So Catholic, Protestant, uh, whatever you want, mostly Christian related ones, can actually exist in Manitoba. It will not be a purely Anglo-Protestant uh, schooling system, mm -hmm. right? So right off the bat, that kind of sets the stage of like the French-English equality that existed at least in the early days of Manitoba, right? And right in number 23, actually, the, right, uh, the next one after, they specifically say that either the French or English language may be used by any person in the debates of the houses of legislature, and both languages shall be used for records and journals uh, of those houses. So again, kind of really forming that basis. The other one that I found rather interesting, and that is drum roll while I find it. Yeah, number 31. Okay. Which is specifically mentioned as uh, 30 and 31, actually, I would mention. So ungranted lands and provisions as to Indian title, as they called it. So for their purposes here, Indians also include what they call in this case half-breeds, so the Métis. Oh, that's a no, no, no word. That's a, that's a big no, no. But that's a big oh, no, no word. Oh, that, that by this time, very icky. By the way, like I've been using Métis, we've been using Métis this entire series, but the, during the whole time, whenever people talked about them, it was always half breed, always. Okay. Yeah, I should have mentioned this before, but yeah, we kind of. Uh, this is a bit of a retroactive addition by me. To say Thank to you. call them Métis. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Never, ever, ever use that word, people, for anything. I don't think it's very common anymore. Still, though. Yeah. I feel like we need to put that disclaimer out there. Yeah. Use obviously. That, that is, ugh, I hate. <laughs> it just makes your skin crawl. Yep. Yeah. 
just for the implications of it, like which, like obviously we know which half is, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so number 30 is interesting and says, all ungranted or waste lands in the province shall be from and after the date of said transfer vested in the crown and administered by the government of Canada for the purposes of the dominion. Interesting use of wasteland here, by the way, like subject to and except in so far as the same may be affected by the conditions and stipulations contained in the agreement for the surrender of Rupert's land by the Hudson's Bay Company to Her Majesty. Right. So the Manitoba Act also kind of formalizes the Hudson's Bay transfer. Um, but yeah, it is kind of interesting that where in 31, it will explicitly lay out the rights of the Indian, uh, of uh, Métis and Indigenous populations, namely the fact that they apparently get 1.4 million acres of land on which they can do what they please. Mm. Um, but, um, well, by the way, yeah, towards the extinguishment of Indian title, right, to the lands. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that like everything else, like whatever waste is considered, is is basically the canadian government so how do you qualify wasteland right or land that's not being used to your own benefit like how do you qualify that obviously for the canadian government it's like oh well is there a farm on it or is there someone living on it then it's if not then it's ours because it's wasted right so there's all, all kinds of like little verbal things that you can play with here and see um and see how that goes eventually mm -hmm. um so yeah basically for our purposes here, uh, Manitoba was granted provincial status, a very basic small area around what we now know as Winnipeg. It's basically a square at first, uh, right beside Ontario. And yeah, so Métis get a large part of land. Métis and Indigenous people would get a large part of land. Bilingual services were guaranteed. But on the other hand, the Red River negotiators had been carefully instructed not to enter discussions with Canada unless an official amnesty was granted for all acts committed during the unrest. And so on top of all of this, it seems like nothing was going to happen, kind of like the list of rights that we had left, uh, that we had read a bit. It seems like the Canadian government was saying, nothing's going to happen to you bef uh, from like what we now know as the resistance. You're safe. I'll give you three tries to guess as if that was true or not. Which one was true? About the fact that they were going to be left alone and not charged for any kind of unrest. Oh, yeah. That's always what happens there, bot. Mm -hmm. Well, we I still mean, have issues with that today. Yeah, we still have issues with that today. But also, and this kind of brings back to one of the points that you said, the amnesty was never put in writing. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yep. Fucking hell. So they just said, yeah, yeah, the amnesty is forthcoming. Um, that's, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't, we don't need to put it down. Like we're, you're dealing with us. Uh, it's, it's fine. You, you got this. Um, so obviously it's entirely based on good faith in this case. And yeah, it's not looking good because as we're winding down this episode, despite the passage mm -hmm. of the Manitoba Act, the government insisted on continuing to send its military expedition into Red River. In this case, it was led by a certain Colonel Garnet Wolseley. Right. And there's an interesting passage that I'll read again from Teye, which is a quote unquote, we come in peace proclamation from Wolseley as he entered Manitoba that says to the loyal inhabitants of Manitoba, note the use of the term loyal here. Mm -hmm. Our mission is one of peace and the sole object of the expedition is to secure her majesty's sovereign authority. Justice will be impartially administered to all races and all classes and will afford equal protection to the lives and property of all races and all creeds. The strictest order and discipline will be maintained, and private property will be carefully respected. Again, what qualifies as private property is, a, is another subject to debate. Or who gets to own private property. Mm -hmm. Should anyone consider himself injured by any individual attached to the force of grievance, shall be promptly inquired into. Sounds good, right? Sounds like, all right, <clears throat> good faith is holding. But nevertheless, um, the expedition would enter Red River in August of 1870, basically as a conquering army with punitive Yay! intentions against the members, conquering, specifically, conquering. specifically against the provisional government, right? Uh, including Louis Riel, who was forced to flee from Winnipeg, uh, where he was at the time, and where he would flee to is possibly the States. He kind of roams around for a bit. But he would it's pretty much Roman. stay away from Manitoba 
until 18, the 1880s, when we'll see him again, and during which we will be... He ain't Greek, he's just Roman. <laughs> and he'll, be, he'll pretty much be, uh, uh, he'll pretty much return for what is arguably the more famous uh, resistance, the Northwest Resistance. Yeah, Northwest Resistance! So a month later, on September 6th, 1870, Adams Archibald was formally installed as Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba. So... Whether or not Manitoba was an autonomous province or one effectively occupied and controlled by the Canadian military was kind of subject to debate, but the military would stay there for quite some time and only eventually gradually move out. We'll kind of address in coming episodes some of the things that, uh, that uh, how could I say, get down from the meat uh, that how could I say Down this? with your bad self. I'm looking, I'm looking for a word that I can only think of in French, découler, that trickle down. Oh, from, like economics. Yeah. <laughs> that always works. That trickle down from the Manitoba Act, namely denominational schools, which would lead to the Manitoba uh, school questions. Um, it would, it, you'll have obviously further um, problems with Métis populations and indigenous populations. We can address the idea of immigrant populations that are coming into Manitoba and the West going forward. So there's a lot of things that are happening. But by and large, the Métis rebellion, the resistance, kind of ended with a fizzle. <laughs> like, three people Not died. With a whimper, yeah. with a bang. It just kind of like ended with the military coming in and the provisional government being forced to flee only to foment in the darkness of like, in the back of people's minds. But I guess that was sort of what they wanted, nobody to get hurt, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mission accomplished. And like theoretically, they got certain things, right? They got the entrance of yep. Manitoba into the Confederation on certain Manitoba! that are written down at least. How well those will be respected is obviously a matter for another time, but at least they got certain things done that they wanted to, mm -hmm. right? Did you have anything that you wanted to mention about anything that we've talked about? We've talked about like two parts now. Okay, so what do you want to bring up about No, 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 this? I think we've been talking about a lot of stuff. Right. <laughs> it's been a long and couple episodes. It, it has been, but I think they were necessary. I guess, yeah. <laughs> In what way were they not necessary? I don't need to learn more about the Canadian Nationalist Party. I'm good. Yeah, I don't think that we'll, we'll bring them up much more. But like, yeah, do you have any gets. final thoughts about anything that we've seen so far? Like, were there any things that you were surprised to learn or that you wanted to know more about, perhaps? Um, I guess how peaceful they were all actually trying to be versus the narrative that we usually get about it, it was mm -hmm. just like a violent rebellion or whatever. Right. Once for the most part, people were just trying to like get things sorted out without causing a kerfuffle. Yeah, people were just trying to be. <laughs> yeah, but they wouldn't let it be. They didn't speak words of wisdom. There you go. You got it. <laughs> right. And what are you kind of taking away from this whole discussion? Debacle. Yeah. Like, what would be the main thing that you would kind of leave with and kind of stick to going forward? Look at history, folks. Just study what came before. Mm -hmm. It'll help you stop it happening again. That's the main thing I have to say. Right. It's like most of these problems could have been solved. Oh, yeah. They could have been solved more easily, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't... I have a feeling that the, the whole... Despite us going through it rather quickly, the whole declaration of the provisional government, I think, is rather indicative um, of what the Métis were pointing out is Canada almost being on autopilot at this point as to its mission to expand mm -hmm. and to <laughs> represent a very specific mindset. Very specific kind of Canada. Exactly. So I'm kind of wondering, like, even if they had been aware of what had happened in the past, I don't know how much it would have changed. Or if, if some people had been aware of what had happened in the past, I don't know how much it would have changed on the grand scheme of thing because of Canada's place as directly being a spawn of empire, if you will. Right? I don't know. Honestly, that's a huge historical if. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm happily surprised that it ended with as much, on paper at least, rights for the Métis secured in some ways with Manitoba, right? Despite the fact that they would not be respected in many ways, but like, I think it's an interesting first step that I'm surprised happily happened as well as it did, despite its downfalls. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
I don't think so. You got anything else? I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Where can people support us, Mac? Through the affiliate links <laughs> or Patreon. Leave a review. Send us an email. Write us a letter through Facebook, Twitter. Yep. Reach out. Leave a comment. Like, comment, and subscribe. Um, shout at us on the street. Yeah, that's totally fine. Throw well. bricks through our windows, but I live up on the 15th floor, so that might be hard. I live on the second. It's not hard at all. Yeah, so throw bricks <laughs> through Patrick's window. But we're a nice neighborhood. We don't do that here. <laughs> sure, you don't. <laughs> um, can't be that nice if you live there. Wow. Can I think that's it? Yeah, I think so. Well, thank you. Pe- I, I can't say it enough. Like, thank you, people, for having stayed with us for 50 episodes and kept the show going. Like, woo, big five. Oh, what, what? What is it? Uh-huh. Diamond Diamond Jubilee? Is that it? Yeah. Awesome. Does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter. Because Thank that's you. an anniversary. If this went on for 50 years, then we would have our Diamond Jubilee. Oh, okay. Fair. This is just 50 episodes. Come on. We're not that special. Not yet. You're special in my heart. I mean, we're special to each other, obviously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but not to regular people. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful holiday season, people, who stayed with us for this long. So, yeah. yeah we'll see you in 2022. What? What? Woo! Hopefully we haven't all died by then. Woo! What is it called? The Omicron virus? Whatever. I don't care. Omicron. Omicron. Yeah. Uh, anyway, see um, y'all in the new year. Omicron. Autobots roll out with the Decepticons. Okay, I'm lending it now. Energon. Bye, everyone. Cheers, a cron.